This is the very tough word of God today for the people of God, but we still say thanks be to God for that word. Um, anybody here old, as old as me or older than me who remembers who Golda Meir was? She was the Prime Minister of Israel, and she was instrumental in Israel becoming a nation in 1948. And she was at an event in Washington, D.C. that was hosted by the United States Press Corps, and she said something that got written down and repeated probably more than most of the things she said. She said, we can forgive the Arabs for killing our children. We cannot forgive them for forcing us to kill their children. We will only have peace with the Arabs when they love their children more than they hate us. Is that a familiar quote to you all, especially that last part? We will only have peace with the Arabs when they love their children more than they hate us. You know, that might be true, but I bet the Arabs could say the same thing about the Israelis. Because don't we love our own children? Is there anyone that you know on this planet who does not love their own children? I always say I can tell when a grandchild has been born because that's the first hand that shoots up during the joys and concerns. Grandmothers will stand on a pew with an air horn going, yes, 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 I have a grandchild, the most beautiful child that was ever born. I thought my kid was great until I saw this one. This one is perfection. Because that wasn't going to get to spoil and send home, right, at the end of the day most of the time. We know how to love our children, but we have to learn to love all children. Jesus is very clear on this in this passage. He's clear on this in other passages. And it's in response to a question. And what was that question again? Do you remember? We just heard it read by Linda. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, who would ask a question like that? Somebody who thought the answer would be, why you are, of course, dear, right? Even James and John send their mama to Jesus to say, which one of my boys is going to be at your right hand when they come into your kingdom? But the kingdom they're talking about is an earthly kingdom. They think Jesus is going to kick Rome square in the pants, get rid of them forever, and reestablish the kingdom of Israel. Although they say in the kingdom of heaven, they still don't really understand what they're talking about because they're thinking in very earthly terms. And Jesus does something so unheard of that it was remarkable enough to be written down by Matthew in his gospel. He calls a child. You have to understand, in the first century, children were seen but not heard. Now, children through the years have had different levels of importance in their culture. But everybody at home, I'm sure there was not a first century daddy who didn't change a diaper at some point of desperation in the first century. But outside the house, boy, patriarchal society, you did not speak unless you were spoken to. And children throughout the ages in some cultures have been treated like little adults. The Puritans who came here from Europe, the first white settlers who came to this country, brought their children who were like little adults dressed with big stiff collars on. And often Native American tribes would kidnap some of these children and they would take them into their villages and raise them as their own children. Now this is something that a lot of people don't know and some people dispute, but I believe it's true that when the settlers would go and steal their children back, the children would run away and go back to the Native people because Native American people are some of the only cultures in the history of the world who let children be children. They were not little adults with responsibilities and they were able to relax in the words of Kaylee the prophet back there. They were able to be kids and most cultures did not allow children to be children. They were seen as little adults with a lot of big responsibilities. But Jesus calls a child to himself. Now, a man would not acknowledge his own children very much in public, much less a stranger. And he puts the child in their midst and he said, unless you become like a child, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Think about that for a minute. Unless you enter the kingdom of heaven like a child, you're not going to get there. The kingdom of heaven meaning the kingdom of God. Not just when you die going to heaven. I don't want you to think that. But unless you are like a child, you cannot understand what it is to be in the kingdom of God. You can't understand what it is to have Christ as your Lord. You can't understand what it is to let God rule over your heart. That comes down to the values of that kingdom versus the values of the kingdom in which we live. Because Jesus says, whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Then he says, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So the way we treat children is the way we really think of the Lord, isn't it? That's what he's saying here. The way you treat the children around you is your, a reflection of your thoughts about me. That is a harsh statement if you think about the way children are treated in societies around the world, society in general around the world. 
within cultures as well, within our own nation, within our own community. How we treat children is how we feel about Jesus. Before that, let's go back to that question I said before we're going to talk a little bit about what's the difference between being childish and childlike. Childlike is open, honest, loving, kind, accepting, trusting, innocent, all those wonderful things that children are. Um, Ethan is going on his first trip to Disney World, right? Have you ever seen a kid who sees Mickey Mouse for the first time? It's just amazing when they're really there and they see all these things. And you remember that too, right? How many of you have videos or Super 8 or 8 millimeter movies of your children on Christmas morning seeing the tree for the first time or looking at all the piles of presents and that excitement that they get? That's how Jesus wants us to be with his word and his kingdom. That's childlike. That's wonder. That's awe. That's just this accepting, loving, gracious behavior toward other people. Childish, that's a little different, right? And I know many of an adult that I've seen have a tantrum. Tantrums do not stop when you're 8, 10, 12, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Do they, really? Insisting on your own way. Grabbing things for yourself. That's childish behavior. But Jesus is calling us to childlike behavior. And then he says one of the harshest things that he says in Scripture. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. Have you ever been to a mill and seen a millstone? How big is a millstone? Big. Even the small ones are heavy enough that it would pull you down and you would drown in the sea. Jesus said, better for you to do that than to be a stumbling block for one of these children. So we have to ask ourselves, what are the stumbling blocks that are in placed in front of children when it comes to being part of the kingdom of God? And then we have to ask ourselves the harder question, which ones have we helped to put there, or at least not if we haven't helped to put them there, we have not done much to remove them. I said to be childlike is to love people and to trust people. Children will play with any other kid. Have you ever noticed that when they're little enough before anyone tells them they have to fear somebody because of the way they look or act or the color of their skin or the language they grew up speaking. One of my parishioners years ago taught in an all-white school, an elementary school. She was a second grade teacher. Not a black kid, not an Asian kid, all-white school in West Virginia. Halfway through the year, she was getting a new student, and he was African American. They had social workers from the county. They had principals. They had, they had meetings upon meetings upon meetings because they didn't want this little boy. Because you can imagine how tough it is to come in after Christmas time to a new school in the second grade anyway when everybody already has their friends and their pals and their lunch buddies and all that. They know where they sit in class. And here's a kid who looks different than everybody else in the school. And he comes in and she introduces him to the class and she put him next to this little boy that she said was very sweet and kind and loving. And that little boy immediately looks at him and says, you're black. She said her heart about stopped because she thought, here we go already. And the little boy said, yes, I am. And then the little white kid said to him, Michael Jordan's black, and he said, I know that. And then the little kid looked at him and said, I wish I could be black too. That's what a child does. And Declan, our little guy here who was born deaf, I tell you what, kids will talk to him. They will learn his language. He's got cochlear implants, and we're hoping that one day he will develop hearing that will make him just about the same as a hearing kid, but even if he doesn't, I'm telling you what, little kids learn sign language. I've told you before, the saddest days I had when I served a deaf congregation was when a parent came to me and said, what is my child saying? Because they never learned sign language. That's when you want to plunk them in the side of the head. Sadder than that was the little kids who said to me, Pastor Terry, I wish you were my mommy. And I'd say, your mommy loves you very much. Mommy doesn't talk to me. Those are some pretty serious stumbling blocks that we put in front of children that they don't understand until they're there. Economic resources and wealth can be a stumbling block. I've served congregations where children from the community would come, and one in particular, a little girl who got herself up every Sunday morning, got herself dressed, got herself to church. Without parental support, her mother did not live in the house. She lived with her grandmother, her grandfather, excuse me, and two of her half-siblings, because her mom had 
children by three different men. She hadn't married any of them, and she was addicted to drugs and alcohol and was never home. But this little girl got herself up every Sunday morning and got herself dressed and walked across the parking lot and came to church. One Sunday during communion, she didn't understand something, and she came up to me and asked me where I was in the middle of doing things up in the chancel, and she came up and said, Pastor Terry, could you explain this to me? I told her a little bit, and I said, I'll talk to you later if that's okay. I can't tell you the number of people who came to me and complained and said, you should have told her to sit down and be quiet. To which I replied, you should have invited her to sit with you so she had somebody she could ask other than me. But she didn't dress very well. But my favorite example is this lovely woman, and I adored her. She died a few years ago. And I was asked to go back, and that was one of the few times I went back because her husband had never asked me to do anything before, and he asked me to do that, and the pastor invited me, and I went and spoke at her funeral. I think I told this story at her funeral as well, and it got a good laugh. She was the woman who was the trainer of the acolytes. Those are the little pastor-dressed people in their little robes that come up and light the candles and things. She had fussed at this boy because he came and had sneakers sticking out under his acolyte robe, and she said, if you don't wear good shoes to church, you shouldn't even come. They never came back, that family, because he didn't have any other shoes. And I kind of told her what I thought about that. But then her grandchildren flew in from Hawaii. And they were about four and six years old, and they were horrible. They were horrible. They were standing on the pew. They were yelling out loud. They were running back and forth. They were unwrapping candy through the whole service, going back and forth to the bathroom yelling out loud, the little boy hit the little girl, she screamed, she pinched him, he was there rolling around fighting and everything else, and I thought, ha, 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 ha. Now you see what it's like. This woman walked up to me at the end of the service and said, could you believe my grandchildren? And I said, yes, they're kids. And she said, they were absolute angels, weren't they? I thought she was joking, but she wasn't, because she could see it in other kids, but not in hers. That's what we gotta do, we gotta start looking at every child not just in this congregation, but in this community, in this nation, and throughout the world, as if they were our own flesh and blood, because that's what Jesus calls us to do. That's what he calls us to do. That's why we hired Stefan. Most churches have laid off staff because of the pandemic and because of the economics, and we put the money there. We didn't put it in the budget this year. We took money that we had, and we hired someone you know why we hired him above the other applicants? Because he was the only one who told me when he met me the first time, he said he wanted children to know how much God loves them. I said, what got you into teaching? Because he's a Head Start teacher. He said, I had two little cousins and I fell in love with them and I saw how much they wanted to learn and all I wanted to do was teach them. And, and in the church, I want to teach children how much God loves them. That was enough for me. That was enough for our SPRC. Other people came in telling us about their credentials and how much experience they had and how good they were at their job. He came in talking about his love for children and God's love for children and wanting to put those two things together. We've got to embrace the children that God has given us as a community, not just as our own children or grandchildren. I know you love them best. I know they're your favorites. They've got to be. My parents erected a shrine when my niece was born. It's still there. There is a wall of pictures of my niece. And I always give my mother a hard time because I was number two. My sister was three and a half when I was born. And there aren't many pictures of me because they had two kids at that time. They didn't have time for pictures. But then in the middle of my niece and nephew, there's a picture of my dog from years ago. My sister was not amused by that, but it was the grand dog. That's as much as they got from me. And it's been hard on me on me through the years, because I, I've shared with you openly, I could not have kids, physically could not have kids. One of the reasons I never got married till I was 42 years old, because I didn't want to cheat anybody else out of that experience. But God's given me a lot of kids through the years. And occasionally I'll get a Mother's Day card, usually not from somebody little. I got a Mother's Day card once from a woman in her 80s saying, thank you for being the mother of this congregation. I thought, wow, I'm old. But no, but we're called to parent one another. We're called to come to Jesus like children and to welcome children into our midst. And that means we're going to go above and beyond. That means we're going to teach them as much as we can about loving God and about God's love for them. We're going to let them be kids when they do it. And if they make a mess or yell in worship, we're not going to give them the stink eye, as they say. 
we're going to understand and remember that once we were sitting with kids of our own and they may have fussed and squawked, but we're going to love them through it, aren't we? So, be like a kid. Come to God with an open heart, trusting that what God tells you is true. You don't have to check it for yourself. You just know it's true. Come to God relaxed, without responsibility and care in terms of God's love for you, but then turn to the world with that responsibility and care toward others in Christ's name so that you might remove any stumbling block that there might be that would protect a child or prevent a child from getting to God. You be the one who moves the stones away, and you will know joy and happiness and peace like you've never known before. To the glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, amen.